Hey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Jewish Wisdom for Coping with a Pandemic. Uh, today, we are moving on to a new soul trade in our journey, or I should say returning. We've been here a few times before. And this for the next two weeks, we're going to be focusing on the soul trait of truth. So as is our custom, let us relax in our chairs and do a short meditation to create some sacred space. So please uh, close your eyes and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And again, inhale through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. As you go at your own pace of inhaling and exhaling, if thoughts should come into your head, just observe them and let them pass like watching a car move past on the road. Now is not the time for solving problems. Right now, all we need to do is inhale through the nose and hold, and exhale through the mouth and hold. And on your next inhale, say to yourself, Shema, and on your exhale, listen. Shema, listen. And Shema, listening deeply, without judgment, without offering advice. And Shema, listening with an open heart. Shema, listen. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. And like Elijah appearing, we've had some new people join us. Janet, hello. Randy, hello. I always love that kind of waking up and or not waking up, but opening my eyes and seeing some new people appear. So hello, welcome. Nice to see you. Today, let's begin with a bit of a follow up from last week. And the question for us to begin with is, how did love and kindness show up for you? Uh, many of us were here uh, one of the last two weeks where we've been working on love and kindness. So how did this show up for you? Either something that you practiced or a time you were challenged? Um, and did you try one of the practices um, which were uh, suggested um, at the end or a different practice during this week? So that's where we are. Who would like to begin? Yes, Bonnie. So I, especially during the pandemic, but something that I've done for a long time, um, but really was spot, really worked hard to do it during the pandemic, was that when I'm on the phone or in person, which rarely happened, but on the phone with a service provider, um, and this person has done a really, really good job, I always ask to speak to a supervisor. And I say to the person, I'm going, I'd like, and of course I, I say, can you, can I speak to a supervisor? And the first comment is, oh, is there something wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. You've done a great job and I want your supervisor to know it. Part mm -hmm. of that comes out of being a school principal because, you know, head of school, because you want everybody to know when things are good, because when there's a problem, it's yours, whether it's yours or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I normally um, am able to speak to someone, but I never know 
if it makes any difference. Mm -hmm. um, about a week and a half ago, I was something happened with my granddaughter's college fund, and I just couldn't figure out what I had done. And so I called, it's a particular company that handles the fund. And I spoke with this really, really wonderful young woman. Um, and she got online with me and we were able to correct a mistake. And I was on the phone with her for a good 20 minutes. So again, it would have been, can I speak to your supervisor? And I changed it this time. I do not know if it will make any difference. But I said to her, when you get your supervisor on, I want you to know I'd like you to stay on. I'd like you to hear what I'm saying to your supervisor. And I'd like your supervisor to know that you're hearing it. Hmm. Um, Again, I don't know if it makes any difference. I didn't say this to her. I don't know if it makes any difference. I don't know if they're going to do anything. But I wanted, because I know that people only ask to speak to a supervisor, I think 98% of the time when there's a problem. Yeah. Not to say thank you and specifically what this person did. So, and it was because of what we were doing on loving kindness that I said, I'd like you to stay on the phone. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a great way of keeping the awareness of what we're working on and finding ways to kind of incorporate it into your life. So thank you for sharing that. Karen. I was reading Time Magazine this week, and I just want to read its two sentences here in a short article that is a beautiful bridge between kindness and truth. It's called Why You Need a Kindness Log by Johanka Delgado, who is a Wallace Steiner Fellow at Stanford University. And it says, the idea of a gratitude practice is neither uniquely mine nor particularly new. But that's the point, really, to find sustenance in what has always been true. Nothing in this brief life is promised, but this one irrefutable truth. There are good people out there who mean you well, and who show up in these moments of everyday kindness. That was just one of those, in quotes, again, not a coincidence for me, that bridged chesed from last week to truth showing up this week. Thank you, Karen. It is amazing how these things show up in our lives when we're you know, when we need them or when we're focused on them. So thank you for sharing that, that's great. I don't know whether it's Paul or Carrie, but I see the hand uh, up. Yeah, I had a, uh, I, it, I've had a, a journey uh, at work with it. We have a, I have a particular customer and um, he's been very difficult. He's very nice. Um, our product is software and it can be difficult to learn. Uh, he is not particularly open to learning. He would rather say that he can figure it all out on himself. And uh, we've really tried to work with him a lot. And so this, this is, uh, I was thinking about, you know, that what I did is I, <clears throat> after we spent quite a bit of time uh, on, uh, on a Zoom call basically with him, kind of walking him through what happened with the, his problem and how to fix it and whatnot, I uh, followed up with a, um, some information about what he needs to keep in mind. And um, I was very, very uh, direct. I, I made sure that I copied his his boss as well. It was not meant as a mean thing. It was meant in many ways, because I have colleagues who have been spending quite a bit of time as well and they get frustrated. So my, my, I was looking to thread the, the needle in, in many ways to be very direct uh, but not by being snarky or nasty, just saying this is what you need to do. It's very important to understand how things can go, you know, basically bad quickly. You don't follow the directions exactly. Um, so I, I did this so that I was also letting my colleagues know that I was doing my best to protect them by right? sort of laying out some boundaries while also being as kind as I could while still being very direct uh, with this one person. So it was an interesting way. It was not like a second sweet loving kindness by any means. It was really um, going to be very um, forthright. But that was interesting. 
Yeah, thank you, Paul. That's a great example of, uh, you know, we don't want to get into a situation where there's too much love and kindness and we're so kind that it becomes a time sink for many people and frustrating for many people. And it's also a great example of telling the truth with kindness, you know, which is uh, Hebrew, it's chesed to emet. It's almost like its own thing, it's almost like its own soul trait, truth with kindness. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, Wendy. I'm sorry. I changed my mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. You're allowed to do that. Joanne. All right. So um, I didn't do anything out of the ordinary, but I did help out like last week with the mailing at the synagogue and then I called them again. Uh, well, they called me and asked if I could help out and I said yes. And um, last week and also this week, I called my friend Sue who lives on the other end of town if she could help out because otherwise it's just me and Steve who's the, like the office manager. And uh, you know, it's just nice to have another person helping. Uh, stuffing envelopes and stamping and anyway so she did come so that was good and I gl was glad I reached out to her but you know for me I really feel like it kind of makes my day when I have a mitzvah of some kind to to do so next week I'm giving um, preparing a meal for somebody who's been very sick lately and but what I really wanted to talk about is that last week my back it was like my shoulder. I have osteoarthritis and it was killing me, killing me, killing me and taking, using my healing pad and taking um, naproxen and a uh, muscle relaxant at night and it was still killing me. And when I went to yoga on, um, I guess it was just this Wednesday, I figured I'd tell the teacher because I wasn't sure if I did something in her class or not. Mm -hmm. but. She, you know, she gave me some very good suggestions and she also came over and like, you know, like she'll put her hands on you and it is, it's like heaven. And now my shoulder doesn't hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call loving kindness. <laughs> Use mm -hmm. a lot more of that. That's so fantastic. And especially in the pandemic, like we haven't been hugging people and touching people. Oh, that made that's my just... week. Be really wonderful, and I'm glad it helped you with your pain. Let's say a quick hi to Irene. Nice, thanks for joining us. Um, anybody else uh, care to comment on this? Okay. So, um, if we look at our, our four assumptions. The one that um, I think really speaks to truth is this idea that we have this conflict between the evil inclination or the evil impulse or the hostile impulse, the selfish impulse, um, and the good inclination or a giving or caring impulse. And we have, you know, we have these, these conflicting options and different choices on how we and how we show up in the world and uh, so as we think about um, and as we start to explore truth and we explore truth and falsehood um, any any just initial thoughts about the role of the, the good information and the evil information in this in this process Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so we're, we're talking about this, this conflict between the good inclination and the evil inclination and the evil inclination being kind of our selfishness or anger or other emotional drives. And the good inclination is like our prefrontal cortex, thoughts, logic, compassion, giving. And we have um, sort of within Jewish tradition and within neurobiology, we know that these sorts of different impulses um, 
current opposition. And ideally, what we'd like to get to is guiding the evil inclination with our, with our good inclination. So as we go through today, you know, the question is, you know, how might this relate to truth? And it's a question we could talk about now or later. I see Karen has raised her hand to comment on this. So Karen, what are your thoughts? I think as it relates, the evil inclination is sometimes, oftentimes, easier than to do right. And mm -hmm. that would transfer to sometimes lying being easier than telling the truth, which sometimes can be complicated and difficult. Yeah, yeah, it could be taking the path of least resistance, could be taking an easier path. Another thing I thought about is the evil inflammation also is where a lot of our self-preservation impulses come from, which are not bad in and of themselves, but if we become fearful about a situation, it's sometimes more likely that we might be untruthful because you know, we feel like it's too scary to, to be truthful in a, a certain situation. Okay, so let's take this a level deeper. And so, as I hinted in the email today, I wanted to talk about, a little bit about the difference between, even before we define truth, you know, maybe what's the difference between truth and falsehood? And uh, there's this saying from the Midrash of Rabbi Akiva that falsehood has no legs. And it's a little bit of a play on words uh, in the Hebrew where it was written, because the, the Hebrew word for truth is emet, olive, mem, tough. And I have to say, I'm really excited because my daughter got me these little stickers I could put on my keyboard with the Hebrew letters. So now I can actually sort of hunt and peck and type in Hebrew when I switch over to the Hebrew. So I'm kind of practicing with that. And then the Hebrew word for uh, falsehood is sheker. And that's shin kufresh. So does anyone know who might know the Hebrew alphabet notice anything about these, these letters? Bonnie. They have feet. Well, the emet starts with an aleph, which is the beginning of the alphabet. The sheker starts with a shin, which is the end of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, the tough that ends emet is the last letter of the alphabet. I just, and the letter before it is a shin. So to me, they are in opposite places, which is very good because it's like having a wall between them, I think. Isn't sheker also have a Yiddish word for someone who drinks? I don't know. I don't know Yiddish. Um, I don't know either, but it reminds me of something my grandmother said. Yeah, so. like sheker, but it's it's the same, and maybe related. And that's what I'm asking, because my yeah, Yiddish consists of five words. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the one part you described is Aleph Man Tough. That's sort of you can almost think of that as like a three-legged stool within the alphabet. Mm -hmm. It's very solid. It's very well spread out. Mm -hmm. In Shin Kuf Reish, there's I had, had a different idea from uh, slightly different from what Rabbanim said. Um, those three letters are next to each other in the alphabet. So it's like they have no legs, whereas truth has this sort of three-legged stool, but the three letters that, that make up um, falsehood, you know, they're just all together. So it's very wobbly. They can't, um, can't stand up to scrutiny or to pressure. So, uh, I would like to just engage a little bit in what people think. What might be the difference between truth and falsehood? Yeah, Joanne. I think you're on mute. I was just saying it's like a stab in the dark, but I'm thinking, um, you know, like, to tell a falsehood, it seems, well, some people are big liars anyway, so you can't believe anything they say, but, you know, I think it takes more, like you have to think about it 
to, to, at least in the beginning, to, to tell a falsehood. Whereas the truth might be in your heart and what you see and observe, you know, it can be something tactile, it can be something visual, um, or something that you learned or, or some knowledge, um, or what you actually experienced. Whereas falsehood doesn't have any, it has no legs because it has no basis in anything. Yeah, thank you, thank you, John. Other other thoughts about the difference between truth and falsehood? Hmm. Yeah, Wendy. Just thinking about characteristics, that if falsehood were like a cartoon character and truth were like a cartoon character, falsehood would be that cartoon character that shuts doors and slams doors and makes it impossible for anything to get done and truth would be opens doors and you know and, and it's kind of lifting everything up oh. and, and allowing things to get done or, <laughs> or said or that's just i'm just thinking of little cartoon characters that's all i was thinking falsehoods close the door truth opens the door i love that kind of uh that kind of metaphor for how yeah, it's a great image of truth truth and falsehood thank you I think there's um, a difference in the motivation behind truth and falsehood. I think um, truth has a more pure, good-hearted mo motivation, and falsehood is the opposite. Hmm. Yeah, so we tend to associate sort of truth with having a good mo <coughs> motivation, and falsehood maybe not having a, a good motivation. I think... As we delve into this, let's let's come back to that because I think on the first approximation, that's that makes a lot of sense to think about it that way. But one of the things about truth is it can get a little bit, you know, as we delve into it, it can get really complicated. Here's why I wanted to start here. Which one's easier to identify, falsehood or truth? Huh. Yeah, Karen. I would think it's much easier to identify a falsehood than truth, especially if you're talking about in the subjective, which I think is what Musar's relationship to truth is. Um, in the objective, it's an irrefutable fact. In the subjective, there can, I don't know if there can be more than one truth, but there is more than one perceived truth. So I think that makes it harder to identify. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was going for. Um, and that's where it gets really interesting when we get into this idea about what is the one truth? What are multiple truths? Bonnie, is that a new hand raise or an old hand raise? No, it's a new one. Okay. Um, often you hear about eyewitnesses to accidents. And, ev and it seems that everybody who sees it or often they have a different understanding of what happened. Mm -hmm. And in their mind, it's truth. Mm -hmm. So that seems to have a spectrum. I was uncomfortable with some of the readings I did on truth because especially when they use the, the example of the bride, um, whether she was really beautiful or only beautiful on the inside, but it, but it isn't set in stone. The other piece that I saw that I thought about was like a, you do one mitzvah, it leads to another mitzvah. Often when you tell a lie, it leads to another lie. And then you're covering the first lie and it rolls into a massive amount of lies. That is the danger, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Randy. Yeah, I don't know quite how to say it, but uh, even truth itself, because in a human sense, most truths are finite truths. And it's like there's this fabric of interrelated things that are infinite that make up the, the universe and that truth lies more in that way, uh, something that's true 
sort of repairs the world. It makes things better. It recognizes the values of other people. I like what you said about the, I was rereading the chapter about the lady that told her employer, oh, I shall celebrate Shabbat because she needed to be home with her kids. But even though she really didn't. And, uh, but there was a truth in there that uh, all I would say, there's times when it's right to give a falsehood because it would do great harm in the world or to ourselves that I don't know quite how to say that. So it's not so simple the way we normally, and I, I think in Judaism, there's the recogn recognition because there's like truth. But there's understanding and then there's wisdom. And you can have a truth, but that what good does that do you if you don't have understanding? And you can have understanding, but if you don't have, you know, I, I think in Musar that that's one of the things we're aiming for is to have wisdom. Absolutely, wisdom. And another word I would add to that is kindness. We talked about earlier. You know, I think I also wrote in the chapter. I, I was, you know, very big on giving people the unvarnished truth, and that did not serve me well. So we have Joanne and then Irene. Okay, so there actually is um, the example of the white lie in the Bible when. Uh, when Sarah hears that she's going to have a child at age 99 and she says, I'm going to have a child and my husband is so old. So God says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh when, uh, when I said she was going to have a child? Uh, I mean, can't I do anything I want to? And he didn't say anything. He said something else, not because you are old to Abraham, because that would have upset Abraham. And so that's given as an example of when it's appropriate to say a white lie to save somebody's feelings, you know. You know, does this make my butt look big? Don't get saved the truth. <laughs> yes, my rabbi in a Rosh Hashanah uh, sermon once said, there can only be one answer to the, these pants make me look fat. You know, there's only, there's only one right answer to that question. So, um, yeah, that's a wonderful example. And yeah, uh, I think Sarah even said, my husband is old and withered. And, uh, and uh, God's, God answered Abraham, oh, Sarah was laughing because she was thinking about how old she was. So it's actually God that's telling the white lie, you know, in the name of peace, in the name of happiness, etc. So um, Irene. Well, I was thinking of a similar a similar idea to Joanne, which is um, lies can lies can sometimes be good things. Like when you're hiding someone who might be killed if you don't lie that they're in your house. Hmm. Um, so truth can be used as a kindness or in 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 um, protection, and also as a kindness to prevent hurt feelings. Hmm. Um, but also truth. Did I say truth? I meant lies. Lies can be that way. But truth can be used as a spear. Sometimes people use truth to hurt people. So I think truth isn't always, telling truth is not always good. And lying sometimes can be. Yeah, it gets pretty hairy. It gets pretty complicated. Yep. And uh all right, well, let's, uh, let's go a little deeper. I'm going to put the slide up, then I'm going to let my cat in the room. So may I have a volunteer while I go get my cat to read, um, read this? Someone wish to unmute. Emmet, only God sits on the throne of truth. Humans have limited perceptions and faulty memory, meaning that each of us can have our own version of the truth. Mm. Truth is learning to see the truth from another's perspective. As it says, 
execute the judgment of truth. Zechariah 816. Thank you, John. Okay, I'm going to copy this so I can paste it in the chat. So we have three different um, three different texts there. This guy, since my kids went back to college, he is very needy of attention. Come on, come on up. There. I don't I don't understand the first sentence. Who is, is Emmett a person? Emmett is, sorry, Emmett is, um, uh, is the Hebrew word for truth. Ah. So, so I apologize for that. I should have made that clear. It's also the kind of male lead in the, the show Legally Blonde. It's a guy named Emmett, but that's not um, what we're talking about here. But yes, I should have made that clear that the Hebrew word for Emmett so if we kind of contrast the first and the second bullets, what is kind of the, the message or what's the, the idea there? And some of you touched on this earlier. Yeah, uh, Paul and then Irene. Yeah, so I, I think this is um, kind of goes to what we were, what, what other people were talking about earlier, which is that telling a falsehood is sometimes the um, is fine. Telling the truth is other times uh, cruel and not 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 at all helps the situation. And so um, being able to see the truth, and that's sort of what I see that the, the last item, the, the last sentence, kind of gets at as well that. If uh, only God sits on the truth on the throne of truth, then God sees all, sees everything from all perspectives, from all dimensions, all facets. And because humans have limited perceptions, faulty memory, we have our own version, and uh, only one dimension. Right, and only one dimension, at least at a time. And unless we work really hard at incorporating other views, other points of view. It can be very easy to simply sit with this is what I see and this is all I want to see. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Irene, what would you like to add? I, I think the um, truth is learning to see the truth from another's perspective is, is I, I don't know if I see that as being truth. But um, it's certainly a helpful idea to, to see perspectives of how other people see things. Mm. And maybe it helps you assess the truth. Great, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a very legitimate point of view, sort of wondering, well, you know, if I'm seeing from that perspective, does that mean it's the truth or not the truth? It's a... It's a question for sure. Um, Wendy. Well, it's just really briefly, God knows truth. We search for truth. So we're kind of on a different level, a different, that's just what I thought that meant. I love that sort of contrast, you know, we are searching for truth. I want to come back to the example someone brought up earlier about if there's like a car accident and you get all these witness statements which do not agree or you know you have an argument with someone who you're, you're dating or a friend or a co-worker or something and you get in an argument and both people walk away with really different ideas about what happened or what the issue was and you know oh, we were arguing about this so this is what happened no that's what happened and um you know neither person is lying right like sometimes people are gaslighting but let's just give everybody the benefit of the doubt here where everyone's really earnestly just see the situation really different you know what's the truth you know what what really happened in the throne room between Gen Daenerys and Jon Snow, you know, who, who knows? I mean, um, 
So, you know, what is it, how does then executing the judgment of truth kind of come into play in those kind of situations? Yeah, Karen. If it's really important to discern the truth, then we can follow King Solomon's lead with the two women and whose baby is it? Hmm. He decided to divide the baby in half and the true mom said, no, give the baby to the other person. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we can so the taken approach to try to ferret out like who's telling the truth and who's who's telling a falsehood. And that's that's a clear-cut situation where at least there can't be two mothers to the baby. And um, for people who may not be familiar with the story, uh, one woman, she was asleep and rolled over on her baby and it died. And she took another woman's baby and claimed it as her own. And both women were claiming they were the mother of this child. And they both went to King Solomon to decide. And as Karen said, he said, okay, well, let's take a sword and cut the baby in half. And you know, you'll each get half of the baby. And one of the women said, no, no, it's hers. It's hers, you know, it's not mine. And then King Solomon said, well, you must be the real mother because you're willing to give up the, the child in order to save its life. Okay, well, let's look at another facet here. And this is um, when it comes to talking about difficult experiences. So may we have a, uh, a volunteer to uh, read this. Is someone we haven't heard from yet today? I'll read it. Okay, good. Isaac endures tremendous struggle in his life, but rarely speaks of it, choosing the quiet path to healing. Imagine facing a trying situation in your life and speaking truthfully about it. How might the Genesis story have been different if Isaac, Abraham, Sarah, or Hagar, Hagar had spoken out, has spoken out? Rabbi Jennifer Gubitz, yeah. Mr. Toa Con to commentary. Great, thank you. So Isaac, you know, has this tremendous trauma early in his life, but he's bound by his father and put on a pile of sticks. Um, and this father standing there with the knife to sacrifice him until the very last second. And there's no record of Isaac ever discussing this. And so if we've had like a difficult situation, are we obliged to talk about it? When do we talk about it? When don't we talk about it? You know, how is that a, is that a truth we're re required to share? Yeah, Carrie. Um, you're not required to share, but if you want to be free of the pain, that's where sharing is important mm -hmm. and and also to be able to um be happier or just you know not be miserable um trauma just affects us in so many ways and somehow that trauma has to be released if one isn't going to be stuck so isaac may have been stuck uh, all his life and, and may have been able to do other things, and great things, if, if that hadn't happened to him. Thank you. And been able to talk about it. Yeah. Wendy. Well, I think that's where motivation might come in. Um, are you telling the truth about your situation and, and sharing that? 
what's the outcome going to be? Is it going to lift people up? If it, is it going to heal the world? Is, is it going to have a good outcome? Or is it going to make people afraid, frightened? You could keep it in, you know, but then it, it could be something you should, should share. So it's a motivation and, and that's where that, that executes the judgment probably comes in. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, that's a great time to, you know, there's judgment, is the impact on other people. And of course, like, what is the impact going to be on us? You know, is this a safe place to talk? Um, Marianne. Um, you may have heard of Brene Brown. She's a researcher and she researches things like shame and vulnerability. Um, and what she says is that when we make ourselves vulnerable by maybe divulging something that allows us to connect better with each other. So um, I maybe err on the side of um, airing my stuff <laughs> a little bit because I think it helps build connection between people. Mm. Because then the other person feels that may, may feel, oh, well, you know, Marianne told me this, maybe I can share this with her and then you can support each other. And mm. Yeah, Brene Brown is just a genius. I'm a huge, huge fan. And, uh, oh, are you? Yeah. Yeah, her work is really groundbreaking. And I, I used to yeah. call her Andre Musar Master Brene Brown. And then someone got really offended by that because she was Jewish and she didn't actually do Musar. And, so I, I less often use that phrase, but her, her work on vulnerability and shame is just um, groundbreaking. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Who was that? Uh, Brene Brown. Brene Brown. Let me type the name in the chat. Uh, we'll hear from Randy and then we'll go to our breakout groups. I don't know if it relates with Isaac, but I guess it relates with family situations because uh, I was thinking on truth and falsehood and, you know, like when people get older and have Alzheimer's and dementia and I know I had to get trained a little bit that way because what I was told, no, you don't correct the person, you know, like the mm -hmm. my mom had that at one point and she'd say oh I'm leaving tomorrow I'm going to go back home with my mom and things like that and it's like that that was her truth that that's where she was living and what made her able to and it's like yeah well that's nice and you know I did I found myself in an odd situation but to be caring I, I, I thought of my own life, that was one place where it wasn't just one untruth, it was just a whole conversation of untruths, but it, it or, or I guess it, but maybe not, because that was the kind thing to do. And it was, I don't know how to say it, it's like the, that was the true and right thing to do, or maybe if a if it was my child that was five and they said something and it's like, no, I need to correct them even though this hurts because in your life in the future, if you believe that, you know, you're going to have more difficulties. So I don't know with Isaac, you know, in, in some of those situations of being vulnerable can make things better, but I know there's sometimes when it, you got to leave things stand the way they are. And, and, yeah, thank you, Randy. That's a love, lovely example of kind of seeing, seeing the truth from another's perspective and, um, you know, and really uh, prioritizing kindness, which is what, and it's also thank you for sharing that you need to be trained to that. Yeah, like we're not, that's not natural. And how no one teaches us how we're supposed to act when our parent gets dementia and starts saying things. It's like, whoa, wait, what's, what's going on here, you know? So, um, all right, well, as we get ready for our breakout groups, here is what we will talk about today. 
So this is a reading from Marilyn Saltzman's book, uh, who's, it's like a Mozart book about her relationship with her grandchildren. And basically she's saying, rather than say, I told you a million times I don't like hot dogs, I would say I had a bad experience with hot dogs as a kid and still don't eat them. It was a small distinction perhaps, but one that led me down the path of truth telling rather than down the slippery slope towards lying. Um, and so this is how she resolved a particular challenge she had around truth. So, you know, maybe with your, your partner in a safe and confidential and not judgmental space, maybe you can share where do you find yourself challenged by the truth? Is it seeing another's perspective, embellishing stories, making yourself look better, being too harsh? So that's, um, that's kind of, and if you'd like to give an update, you know, of course, are always welcome to do so. So I'm going to put this, I'll stop the share. I'll put this in the chat. And I will open the rooms. Okay, so you should see uh, a join. For those of you who are streaming,